So, I love hair. <laughs> um, I love talking about hair. And specifically, I love my own hair. Uh, my boyfriend and my friends can probably tell you about listening to my hair monologues and my hair rents. Um, I have a four-step hair wash process. I have a dedicated hair wash day. Um, I may be a, a little bit of a, a narcissist, just a little, just a wee bit, but really just about my hair, though. <laughs> um, and I love my hair, particularly in this point in time in my life, uh, because there is a, a movement in the black community among black women, and it's been dubbed the natural hair movement. And um, that means black women are starting to embrace the hair the way it grows out of their head and not chemically relaxing their hair. Um, I guess if you conjure an image of a black woman in the, in the 1960s, 1970s, you, you probably think of an a afro and a black turtleneck and, and a leather jacket. Um, and, but since, since the 1970s, um, black women have kind of rejected the afro and the natural look and have kind of... A, conformed and assimilated and chemically relaxed their hair with a chemical relaxer. Um, but in, in the last 10 years, uh, black women have started to return to their natural state. And some women call it going natural and some women call it returning natural. Um, I don't have a preference either way. I'm just a, a card-carrying member of the movement. Um, so I love it. I think it's a great time in the black community. I think it means black women now have a choice about what they're doing and how they feel and what makes them feel beautiful. And um, I'm in a natural hair group on Facebook. There are 80,000 members. I go to natural hair meetups, so I'm really involved. And I love it. And so when I heard about the topic for tonight, hair, I was like, yes, I'm going to go up there. I'm going to talk about the natural hair movement. I'm going to talk about myself, of course. And it's going to be great. <laughs> and so I started to write. I started to write my story. And I, I, I realized maybe really in the first 10 minutes that hair has a deeper meaning for me um, than kind of this recent personal transition. I've been natural for about six years now um, when I started law school. Um, and even it's more important than the movement in the black community. Um, hair has a, a legacy in my family that I never quite connected until I started thinking about this story. Um, so as I said in my introduction, I am from Chicago. I'm from the south side of Chicago. And my grandmother, um, her name was Grandma Rose, um, she was a hairstylist and she owned a beauty salon. And it was called the Anderson's House of Style. And my grandmother, um, I was told, was a, a very powerful woman. Um, she was a matriarch. Uh, she ran the house. She was the boss. Um, and my grandfather was successful in his own right, but my gr grandmother um, controlled everything. And the hair salon was a mecca. It was a mecca for the members of my family, and it was a mecca for her clientele in the black community. And if, if most women can relate to me. When you walk into a hair salon, it is home. You walk into a hair salon, it's a little warm because the, the, the dryers are running and you talk about your good boyfriends and your bad husbands and you talk about a lot and that's what, <laughs> that is what I would tell my grandmother's hair salon was and it was the place where women felt safe and they expressed themselves and they left feeling beautiful. Um, and what's interesting is that my grandmother's primary hairstyle, um, she relaxed hair, she did straight hairstyles. Um, my sister talks about my grandmother doing her hair for the first day of school and she would have these sleek, sleek back ponytails and these sleek photos. Um, and so I think we will have an interesting discussion about relaxed versus natural. Um, and so I, I, but I talk about my grandmother in the past tense uh, because she passed away um, shortly actually after I was born. Um, so I don't have any memories really of her or the time in the hair salon. Um, I don't have any personal recollection of that. I just have the stories that I've been told. And so, um, unfortunately, when um, you're the matriarch and you pass away, there is often a void left and, and there's a vacuum, there's a space left to be filled. And um, 
also in the, in the, I was born in 87, she died in 88. In that time in the black community in Chicago, it was the height of the crack epidemic. Um, so my, my parents succumbed to the epidemic, and so they did not feel the void that my grandmother left when she passed away. Um, the hair salon was shuttered in less than a year. Nobody could feel her space. There was no hangout spot. There was no Mecca um, anymore. Um, and so it was a really hard time for my family. Um, it was a, it was it was it was a, a tough time financially, specifically because she um, financed a lot of things. And so my eldest brother, um, Reggie, he's 19 years older than I was. Um, he he tried to step up and to fill the void um, that my grandmother left. And kind of like my parents, he became a victim of the crack epidemic. But in a different way, he became a drug dealer. He sold crack, and he filled the financial void that my grandmother left. And he took care of the family, he took care of my siblings, and he made a lot of money. And he tried to hold it together the best way a 19-year-old kid could do um, in that situation. Um, but for everybody who's seen The Wire, um, <laughs> if, you're, if you're a good drug dealer, two, one of two things happen. You either die, or you go to prison. And uh, fortunately for the Andersons, my brother went to prison um, and he served a, a lengthy federal drug uh, charge in a federal penitentiary. And as a kid, I remember I would go visit him and um, for the, the longest time he was really angry, he was upset, he, he didn't really take advantage of anything, he slept a lot, that's what he told me, he slept a lot when he was in prison. Uh, but I, I did see an uh, evolution over time. He started telling me about the classes he would take in and that he was working to earn his GED and he was really excited about it. Um, and I remember one particular visit, he told me he had something really amazing to share with me. Uh, and he told me that he had taken classes and he had practiced and he had earned a barber's license while he was on the inside. And he said he thought our grandmother would be really proud and I knew she would be. Um, so Reggie, um, when he was released from prison, he, we kind of lost contact. Um, the number one thing they tell you to not go back to prison is to disconnect yourself from the run the reasons you went back. And unfortunately for him, that meant disconnecting from the family. So I knew Reggie was cutting hair on the side, he was making his way, um, but that came from the, the rumor mill. Um, so when I, really this, this awakening in my life, this coming as a woman, accepting who I was as a person, I decided, that I wanted to reach out to my brother and I wanted to reconnect. So about six years ago, right when I was going natural, I, I called him and I called him and I would check in and he would tell me what he was doing he would update me on his life. Um, and we began to reconnect and he started to tell me about the family and the family secrets and he told me about our grandparents and he told me about our grandmother and how amazing she was and he helped paint the picture of my family. Um, and I remember I was coming home for one Thanksgiving break and he told me he had an uh, awesome surprise for me. And he had been working really hard for something. He wanted to show it to me. And I was worried for just a, li a little second because I know he had a, um, a, a bit of a history. But I, deep down, I knew he turned his life around. So I was really excited to see what he had to share. And I came home for a Thanksgiving break. And he picked me up from his house. And we drove in the south side of Chicago. And we went to a south suburbs, <laughs> and I saw um, a barbershop that said Reggie's House of Style. And I came into his hair barbershop, and I sat in his chair, and he puts the cape on me. He gives me a, a, a lining, and um, I, I sat in that chair, and we, we talked, and we, and we bonded. And you know, I've always been jealous because I, I never got to meet my grandmother and I've always heard how amazing she was. Um, but I, I knew sitting in Reggie's chair and getting a haircut by him, sitting in his barbershop, uh, was, a pretty, was a pretty close second. Thank you.